as a society, as taxpayers, and as a sector of funded agencies that have a collective responsibility to provide supports and services to people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, I believe we are actually more invested in exclusion than we are in inclusion. Before I dive into that grand issue, I want to talk about why I care, why that geek, the taller guy there, uh, came to care about any of this stuff. So I know in a lot of cases people who came to enter this line of work because of someone that you do in your personal life, a personal connection, such as a family member uh, or a family that you know that had a, a son or daughter with a disability. For me, it was basically the flip side of that coin. It was not until about the age of 22, thanks to my own error and misunderstanding a job advertisement, which was that it was a job to work with people with developmental challenges. And I thought that meant that it came from a family uh, that was living in poverty. So <laughs> I went to the job interview and I thought, these are the strangest questions I have ever heard in my life. Uh, somehow I got the job, and thus I came to meet for the first time in my life at the age of 22, a person with a label of Down syndrome, a person with a label of autism. And it made me really angry. Because I figured out the reason I'm meeting these people for the first time in my life is they've been hidden from me. They were hidden from me all through school, and they're hidden from me in my everyday life. They don't seem to be in the bars where I go. They don't seem to be playing on the teams where I play sports. Where are they? Where have they been? And what do they do all day? So it intrigued me. And uh, sometime later, uh, with my wife Julie, I found it Play in uh, 1995 to address some of these problems. And then we proceeded for the next 10 years to invest in excluding people, with, of course, uh, the best of intention. So this is uh, probably at the peak of things, peak of our exclusion. In about uh, 2003, we had our day program, proudly had procured government funds for the first time. We had a variety of shelter workshops, which could likely be rebranded as social enterprises tomorrow to get a whole bunch of new money and start all over. Instead, starting about six years ago, we did as uh, Gail Fanjoy from KFI Maine described at her session this morning, we abandoned the failure of our segregated environments and went in pursuit of inclusive results. We committed not only to employment first, but also real homes where you have a key to your own door. Real lives in the community with non-segregated social activities and real friends, not people paid to spend time with you and keep you happy day in and day out. So, people who hate broccoli don't all live together. <laughs> people who wear glasses don't all live together. So why should people with intellectual disabilities all live together, all work together, all play together? These are the fundamental questions we ask of ourselves. And as we sought out other thought leaders and agencies that transformed from excluders to includers, we found without exception, they asked these very same questions and identified that the key barrier to inclusion of the people they were supporting was the agency itself. It was getting in the way. Not only by discounting people's disabilities, but by discounting the problem-solving abundance available in the community at large, beyond the walls of the agency. So I recognize that the FC and the Abundant First Movement definitely represents a large segment of forward-thinking people and agencies but I have to say, I have seen and heard a lot of special things. And I'd like you to consider the idea of special people, special programs, special places, when I next ask a question of you. So, I don't think there's anything terribly unique or original about the guiding statements of our organization. It's a community where everybody belongs, a welcoming community where the people you support are valued by others, a belief that people with intellectual disabilities do in fact belong on this planet. But, let's start with this. How many members of this audience find that these statements more or less resonate with what your agency is tasked with doing? Show of hands. Pretty much 100%. A different question, a follow-up. How many of you find that in spite of these guidelines, a lot of what you do actually results in a lot of special people spending time in special programs in special places? Be honest. Be honest. Pretty close. The hands were not raised as high, the same hands. So, in my own research, uh, these details are often very hard to find because with rare exceptions, 
And neither agencies nor systems nor governments actually measure results based on an outcome like conclusion. They mostly measure how many hours at what cost, that sort of thing. So I think the numbers mentioned by Michael Eaton uh, from the Department of Education at this morning's keynote, it's probably about right. He said in education, about 80% of resources into special education. And that's not to say that all of that 80%, which is probably about what we're investing in terms of supporting adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities, not to say all of the 80% is wrong. Sometimes we need systems, but when I go to the hospital to heal, I want to get the heck out of there. I want to go back to my home with the key that I open and close and my friends and unpaid people and back to my life. The problem in our field is people with intellectual disabilities go into systems environments like group homes and data programs and sheltered workshops and they stay there. That's not what we're supposed to be doing. So three quick examples that I think help take this beyond theory and uh, ground it in reality. So Royce up there at the top with his dad, uh, probably a scene that takes place throughout North American world, newspaper story about a person with a disability that needs certain types of support and can't get any help. The parent has desperately gone to the, to the media looking for help. So, uh, in the story, all the things wrong with Royce are featured prominently, and indeed he has a stack of labels and folders and reports this high. And the basic recommendation is from the system, he is in need of 24-7 constant care, which is simply not available right now, and therefore the family must continue in crisis. So what happened at the work life we introduced to Royce? We tried asking what he wanted. This clearly was not a question that we posed to him. And it took a while to earn his trust and get some of these answers. But in less than two years, he was living in his own apartment with a real job and friends and colleagues who would never recognize the demon represented in the stack. The system failed because they never even thought of Royce as a human being. He was only a stack of papers. Matt said it. When he was born, he was not supposed to walk or talk. Yes, there's nothing left over in the bar. He still carries the label of multiply disabled. But, despite having been told mere months before his special education graduation, a real job was not in his future, he will soon celebrate his one year anniversary at the Imperial Coffee Company. Why? Because his employer and the work play were open to finding out what Matt could do instead of what he could not do. I know we're here to champion employment first, but there's a lot of structural and attitudinal barriers to deal with. Chris, right in the middle, he had tried to join regular sports and recreation in his community. He kept getting referred to special needs boy or special needs soccer. Fortunately, we helped him find a soccer league and a team where he is respected and valued, and with good reason. He can hit a soccer ball like nobody's business. He's included in the carpools. He's included in the beer and wings after the game. His teammates see nothing special about this. They see Chris, a great guy and a great soccer player. Yes, getting it wrong starts with the core dishonesty we call planning. Yes, you know what I mean? <laughs> person-centered planning means you really listen to what the person wants. You support them to revise that list of wants at any time, not according to the staff schedule. And you continually strive to help them realize their goals, hopes, and dreams. Most of what goes on in our sector is not that. It is mostly about offering a limited set of choices that funders and agencies have decided to make available. It is system-centered cloaked in person-centered language. As you make your way back home out of this conference, I hope you will challenge your agency with the fundamental question of whether or not the results of your work lead to inclusion or exclusion, and then start the work of abandoning that which is clearly not the right thing. Stop. In conclusion, please invest in possibilities. Possibilities are people's lives. It's Royce having a home, it's Matt having a job, it's Chris having a soccer team. Please invest in the path of life. Please invest in doing what is right. Thank you.